This video is brought to you by 3, bringing you 4G at no extra cost. The Samsung Galaxy Alpha. This is our favorite Samsung smartphone that doesn't have an S Pen. Why? Well, it largely comes down to that design. And you're watching our full review. Design tends to be what we talk about first. So let's kick off by talking about just that. And you can see what we're caressing here are these metal framed edges. Really, really nice, elegant device based on the fact you've got a slender frame, nice soft touch material on the back and premium factor in its body. It really does showcase the fact Samsung can actually get it very right as far as design goes. Feels very good in the hand and for a 4.7 inch screen device, it also is relatively compact. We can do a few size comparisons now and indeed this is gonna be as much a style comparison as anything. This is a Galaxy S5 mini 4.5 inch screen, water resistant admittedly, but if you take a look at that, there is no comparison. Those high gloss sides just look so much cheaper. And of course, that bulbous back cover again, so much, so much cheaper just find it very very hard to recommend a device like this unless you really need that weatherproofing if you really want a bigger screen then the obvious choice is going to be the samsung galaxy s5 and the galaxy s5 is an incredibly capable device also has a fingerprint scanner a heart rate monitor it's got a qualcomm processor it's very very fast beautiful display one of the best out there especially for an amoled it's managed to taper everything right down and look stupendous better than the samsung galaxy alphas but the design is is just so so inferior it really is testament to how right Samsung has got it with the Galaxy Alpha that the Samsung Galaxy S5 just looks so subpar bringing an iPhone 5s into frame and you can see we're not going to enter our code but you can definitely make out a size comparison and you can see the inspiration but what's really nice is the fact that Samsung didn't just steal and grab they actually added this nice nuance um, into the indent at the top and bottom and it does doesn't really feel like an iphone if we're honest it doesn't have a stark cold backing it just has that really rich metal frame which like we said we're massive fans of the samsung galaxy alpha's main competitor out now is probably the sony xperia z3 compact at 4.6 inches by contrast 4.7 inches it has a superior display superior specs ultimately but doesn't have that cat 6 lte it is also waterproof so it generally does the job on the paper a little bit better but it doesn't have that super high premium elegant factor that the galaxy alpha has if we move that to one side bring in an iphone 6 and the iPhone 6 is incredibly elegant as well. It is a 4.7 inch display, but you can see Samsung's managed to make their 4.7 inch screen device significantly smaller than Apple's. It isn't necessarily thinner, but it still feels like it competes head on, offering something nicely different in this size. While the rounded corners on the iPhone 6 do feel good, they're not as easy to pick up, not as grippy. This feels like a thinner device. The Samsung Galaxy ultimately feels like an equally premium or almost as premium different offering if we move that to one side finally the Sony Xperia Z3 this is going to be the larger device with a metal frame and a really nice expensive look and feel and you can see side by side that Z3 is significantly larger than the Samsung Galaxy Alpha so that should give you an idea as to how Samsung's not flagship compares with all those other devices and hopefully you come to the same conclusion we have it does so very very well as far as the key design elements go on the front you've got that 2 megapixel or 2.1 megapixel front facing camera sensors and an in call speaker the actual display itself is 720p 4.7 inches unfortunately it isn't brilliant we'll come on to that shortly you can see below the screen you've got a home button there's also a fingerprint scanner and either side of the home button are buttons multitasking and a back button right hand side obviously that metal frame which nicely tapers in up top and bottom with chamfered edges power button down at the base micro drilled holes you've also got a micro usb connector one side of the stereo microphones 
Flipping round, you can see the other side of the stereo microphones and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. On the left hand side, that's where you can see the volume rocker. And on the reverse is that really nice soft touch plastic material, a Samsung insignia, a 12 megapixel camera, a flash, and a heart rate monitor too. The back cover is removable, like we said, so we can prise it open by sticking our fingernail under and that reveals a 1865 milliamp battery. It's also got a nano SIM slot, but no micro SD card slot. So an 1865 milliamp battery is pretty fair for a device of this size, but not brilliant. And we're gonna come on to that later, battery being one of this device's, unfortunately, weakest areas. So that screen, 720p, 4.7 inches. For anyone who doesn't know, AMOLED screens come in a couple of varieties, pentile and non-pentile. It basically comes down to the sub-pixel formation, but the Samsung Galaxy Alpha is a pentile screen, which means it has less sub-pixels. So is the stupendous Galaxy S5, but the difference here is the pixels density, the PPI of the Galaxy S5 is way, way higher, over 400 whereas the Samsung Galaxy Alphas is only 312. As a result, it just isn't as sharp as we want it to be. Fine text looks a little bit bitty up close, and despite the fact the colors pop, it just isn't enough. It does have very, very deep black, so if you do things like watch movies on here a lot, etc., you'll be fine for that, but it's really reading where this thing falls down every now and then. Inside that screen, it's Android. Android 4.4.4. We're TouchWiz. TouchWiz is really hit and miss. When you get it out of the box, unfortunately, it's the misses that get in the way. For starters, you've got My Magazine UX. On the left-hand side of the home screen, you can see this quiet, clunky user interface grabs a range of feeds ranging from news right through to social media if you input your details. It isn't very flexible. It doesn't support a a lot of social media channels and on top of that it's quite clunky to just use day to day. It doesn't support offline caching. It does. You get the idea. There's a very long list of things it doesn't do. Thankfully, Samsung gives you the option to turn it off. You just have to pinch through into your home screen settings and uncheck that box. There you can even change things like your transition effect, adding a nice amount of personalization to the mix without going crazy. Now you've just got a continuous stream of home screens and you can add or remove them very, very easily by long pressing and dragging them up to the top. These home screens can be populated by applications and widgets, pull down from the top with one finger and you'll reveal the standard notifications, bar brightness control, S finder and quick connect as well as some quick toggles. If you wanna see all your quick toggles, it's two fingers pull down. As far as the applications tray goes, you can see right here, this can be organized into straight apps. You can also add folders and do a bunch of other stuff as well as link through to Galaxy Essentials. What's nice about the interface is the level of customization Samsung affords you. Like we said, you can change your transition. You can change the color of the actual folders. It's a little bit of fun. Definitely more customizable than stock Android, but not necessarily better. So that My Magazine UX was one example. Another example is the gallery. If we were to open up the gallery, we'll be able to show you one of the options that you can adjust for. If we go into our settings, we can see Dropbox Sync. Dropbox Sync is automatically turned on. If you have a lot of photos in Dropbox, this will download them all. And we had around 20 gigabytes of photos that just immediately threw themselves onto this phone and ultimately slowed everything right down. As soon as you uncheck that box, it will delete them and the phone will fly. But if you do find your performance on the Galaxy Alpha is lagging, that may well be the reason why. We really recommend for Samsung to be a little bit less imposing with things like this. TouchWiz has a lot of potential, like we said, a lot of customization, but it ends up just feeling incredibly, incredibly bloated when you have to actually fix it when you get it out of the box. As far as pre-installed apps go, the real one is S Health, which takes advantage of that heart rate monitor around the back. If we were to jump into that, we can do so either by the widget that's pre-installed or through the application. And we can tap through on the heart rate monitor icon and you can see, tap, touch the heart rate monitor on the back. 
you can see we're recording a video, we're pretty tense. Our last one was 63, but we're currently at 90. We found the heart rate monitor to be relatively accurate, actually more accurate than that of the Galaxy S5. We measured it against a Polar device as well. Um, S Health is also pretty cool because it'll integrate with other apps like Endemondo, etc. Um, but we wouldn't say the heart rate monitor would make that decision between buying this phone or not. The phone also has a fingerprint scanner, and unfortunately, when you're stood like very, very stationary, exactly like we are now, It'll work most of the time, but a lot of the time we'd get either swipe the entire pad or this finger is not recognized, which ultimately makes the whole experience really irksome. Nothing like the iPhone, nothing like the Huawei Ascend Mate 7, for example. So that's another element the UI kind of falls down. We'd rather no fingerprint scanner rather than one that worked every so often. So while the user interface may have a few inerrant issues, the general performance day-to-day -day actually surprised us. Historically, we've found slowdown in touch widths. It's been stutter central. Samsung seems to have nailed that in the bud. It could be testament to the Samsung Exynos 5 chipset in here. It's an Exynos 5 Octa, so octa-core. It's got two quad-core chips, one clocked at 1.8 gig, one clocked at 1.3 gigahertz, as well as two gig of RAM, which is ample, clearly. It was able to play every single game that we threw at it and ultimately makes for a very very good performance experience in general and this phone makes for a good multimedia experience starting off with that screen like we said if you are doing something like watching movies it's absolutely perfect 4.7 inches is definitely big enough and you won't really notice that pentile lack of detail if you're doing something like reading though then the fine detail might be a bit of an issue but pictures movies they look great as far as audio goes sound quality from the 3.5mm headphone jack is good. There's Aptex Bluetooth lossless streaming support, but unfortunately the speaker at the base is far too easy to cover up. If we were to open up a track on Spotify, for example, everything sounds good and you've got decent levels of volume until you cover it up. Now, with a speaker up top, for example, or something, it wouldn't be so much of an issue. But when you do game with the device, you cover it up all the time, unfortunately. And flipping it around really doesn't do much to fix a solution. This means that the Samsung Galaxy Alpha's multimedia chops are very good, provided you have headphones in there. The same can be said of gaming, like we said. We installed a ton of games on here. These included 3D games, 2D games, right from, through from fighting games to first person and shooters, modern combat looked great, Soul Calibur looked great, Rayman Jungle Run looked very clean, and this really means that the Samsung Galaxy Alpha, especially with that 32 gig of onboard memory, could well be one of the best gaming devices out there, despite its very sleek, svelte look. That 12 megapixel camera isn't a slouch either. It records 4K video with really vibrant, punchy colors. Maybe a little bit oversaturated, but many of you guys actually preferred that by contrast to the Sony Xperia Z3's more muted colors, or Z3 Compact. So on top of 4K video, it also takes very good pictures. Widescreen 10 megapixels by default, good in macro, punchy colors is probably the area it wins out the most. Unfortunately, the low light performance isn't great. Samsung's user interfaces tend to slow down the shutter speed and over soften things too much when the lights go down. It's a shame that we couldn't have run any benchmarks on here or many benchmarks. All the 3D gaming benchmarks this thing kind of nailed, but we've tried to run things like Antutu. It's just not optimized for the Exynos 5 Octa and crashed halfway through. We can testify though, the fact that we had such smooth performance throughout and you can definitely see we loaded it up with plenty of applications is a very, very good sign. And again, we've been using it for three odd weeks. If we jump into our storage, you can also see, despite the fact that we have intentionally loaded it up with loads of apps and a few offline playlists on Spotify, as well as one movie, you've still got ample space in here. And that really is the area the Samsung Galaxy Alpha excels because chances are you'll never really need the micro SD card slot that this thing doesn't have. Have. As far as connections go, that's another area the Galaxy Alpha kind of beats all the competition, except for the upcoming Galaxy Note and Huawei Ascend Mate 7. It has Cat 6 LTE, and if you live in London and are on EE, then you may well benefit from this. It means you're gonna get download speeds of up to 300 meg per second, which, frankly speaking, is astounding. It also makes this the fastest Wi-Fi hotspot on the block. 
making it ideal for business users as well as obviously personal users who just want super zippy internet speeds on the go. Finally, wrapping up with our 1865 milliamp battery, and that's the area the Samsung Galaxy Alpha really does struggle the most. It lasts today, it does, but when you've got devices like the Sony Xperia Z3 Compact lasting on, well, bordering two, it puts the Samsung Galaxy Alpha at a slight disadvantage. Still, you can buy spare batteries for it, which is a really nice plus. And Samsung has very cool external battery kits, which will charge one battery in your bag while you've got one in your phone. So for anyone worried about battery, it could even be a better solution if you're okay with carrying a couple of spares with you. So all in all, the Samsung Galaxy Alpha, like we said, our favorite Samsung device that doesn't sport an S Pen. We do still prefer the Note 3 for its longevity. We prefer the Samsung Galaxy Alpha for its design, and we cannot wait until we get the Samsung Galaxy Note 4 in for review in a couple of weeks. Anyone who's thinking of getting the Samsung Galaxy Alpha, fire us a comment in the comments section below. It isn't perfect, but with its Cat6 LTE and that brilliant design, it offers something that other devices in the same category really can't compete with in a lot of ways. If you liked the video, click that like button, and if you like BTECT in general, click subscribe. Thanks for watching.